so much for joining us again uh, tonight uh, for Self Help Graphics Artist Lab. Uh, again, uh, it's a monthly gathering open to creative individuals to hold space, share current projects, and connect with each other. We discuss and address pertinent issues affecting local artists, and it's a space to garner and share resources for both personal and professional growth. We held our first virtual gathering last week, and we were grateful to learn that despite the devastating state of events and social distancing, we are connecting with new artists. We even had a participant join us from New York and a participant joined the, our Wellness Wednesdays from Australia. So it's really exciting to see more people come to, or become aware of self-help graphics. Uh, this month, we are hosting the Artist Lab with more frequency, uh, just to bring forth individuals who can help the great creative community navigate and access resources available. Last week, we had three wonderful women join us and speak about emergency grants for artists, the essential resources uh, for our day-to-day -day offered by the City of Los Angeles, and the tools to encourage us to take the time to process our mental and emotional experiences. If you missed our program last week, please visit our Facebook page or YouTube channel to watch the programs. All the resources mentioned are accessible on these platforms. Last week, one of our, our presenters, uh, Ivan Gallardo, spoke of the shift in funding opportunities that are making applications more accessible to complete in order to provide funds into your hands. We're also seeing more grant opportunities announced since our last gathering, so please look at our Linktree, um, Self Help Graphics website, and um, as well as our current guest website, um, A to Z Grant Writing with Linda. She's also posting those grant opportunities there. Uh, so joining us tonight is our dear friend and family, uh, Linda Vallejo. She is an artist, development consultant, and grant writing instructor. And she's here to share tips and tools to help you apply for grants and then open it up for questions. After she uh, will review two specific grants. The first is the Artist Fellowship and the second is a much more complex grant that's always available. And that's the Paula Krosner Foundation grant. And, um, and for that, because it's a much more complicated grant, that's why I asked uh, Linda to, to tackle that one and with you. Um, in addition, this is a much more financially substantial, uh, it's a much more financially sustainable, substantial grant, excuse me, that's always available and not a COVID-19 uh, specific grant. We will then open the program to answer any questions at the end, uh, well, after each specific grant, um, after she reviews uh, the individual grants. So before we introduce Linda or welcome Linda, I'd like to invite Alexa, our program manager, to read the Zoom participants rules of engagement. Hi, everybody. So just to go over some rules of engagement that we've created to honor the space here, the Zoom session will be recorded and archived for the public on both Facebook and YouTube. Zoom participant faces will be recorded and broadcast live on Facebook. So if you do not wish to be recorded, we ask that you stream it live on Facebook instead. And all Zoom participants are encouraged to use the chat option to post your live questions for our moderators that we'll review during each of the Q&A sessions. Um, oops, sorry. I lost it here. Marve, I'm going to exit your screen really quick. Okay, sorry about that. And um, we ask all of you, all of the participants are currently muted. So we ask that you do stay muted throughout the duration um, of our session here. And lastly, we ask that you be kind and patient throughout our program and when you post your questions to the chat box. So I'm going to hand it off to Linda. Welcome, Linda. Hi. And so um, I'm sharing my screen and, uh, and I'll be scrolling along with Linda. So will they, the student, okay, here I am. Good. Hello, everyone. It's wonderful to see you tonight. I'm very happy to hear that you're well and safe and in the process of learning how to get 
the funds needed to be able to make it through this hard time. Fortunately, there's quite a lot out there right now, and I'm posting every day on my Facebook page, uh, Linda Vallejo, uh, or A to Z Grant Writing with Linda Vallejo on Facebook, so you can find many other opportunities available. We're gonna begin our session today by going through a handout that I prepared for you to understand more about what funding sources expect as a part of a grant proposal package, whether it is for emergency funds or whether it is for grants, fellowships, or residencies. I've named this a document, ABC Grant Writing with Linda Vallejo, and you can see my website, uh, personal art website at the top, followed by adczgrantwriting.com. So here we go. And uh, after I review this two-page document, we'll open it up for questions from you in case there's something that I need to reiterate or explain. The Individual Artist Proposal Package. Before applying for a grant, read along with me. Individual artists need to ask themselves these questions. Do I believe that I'm a good candidate for receiving a grant? In other words, is this grant opportunity a good match for my artistic vision, goals, and efforts? Number two, what will my artistic experience and vision bring to the funding source? Will my project further the funding source's vision, mission, and goals? Three, do the application guidelines indicate a requirement for specific exhibition or performance history? And do I have this type of exposure for my work? And four, how will my artistic career benefit from this opportunity? How will this grant advance my opportunities to exhibit and present my work? Will this opportunity provide additional exposure for my efforts? You need to be prepared to answer these questions because in many cases, funding sources will ask you to write paragraphs regarding these specific types of questions. So the kinds of documents that are required, uh, materials and documents that are required, are six pieces that fit together to communicate the artist's work, as I said her, huh, that's because it's me, philosophy and experience, his or her. Number one is a CV resume, a bio, a statement, work samples, press articles and reviews, and a budget. So we'll go briefly over the, art, uh, the artist's CV resume. The CV lists all of the events in your career chronologically, and a resume is an edited version of the CV. A lot of artists don't understand the difference between those things. A CV is when you first began your work all the way up to the present point, and a resume is more edited for a specific opportunity. Each funder will have a different length of resume that they will require. In your CV and or resume, you will include the following. Number one, birthplace and date, optional. Education. Three, awarded fellowships and grants. Four, permanent collections. Five, professional affiliations. And six, exhibitions, publications, special projects. This is the way that I share my resume, which you can see on my website, lindavallejo.com, under the About tab, you can see how I uh, arrange these information. Uh, professional affiliations are really interesting for funding sources because it tells them more about you as an artist. I was a gallery owner and I also am a grant writing consultant, which gives my personality a little bit more flavor and a little more interest. In number six, when I say exhibitions, publications, and special projects, what I do is I list every year, 2020 exhibitions list, publications list, and special projects lists. Special projects are anything that you do in the community. Anything you might do like a workshop today. This workshop will be on my special projects list for 2020. A publication you might be a part of, a voluntary position that you might have taken, something like this. Your resume should, read, should be easy to read and saved as a PDF ready for load up. Making your heading stand out with bold facing, italics, underlining, or bullets is always a good idea. Remember to list items by the most recent and update your resume regularly. It's much easier to apply for grants and other opportunities when your resume is already prepared. The artist bio is the next item. The bio combines the resume and the artistic statement, which we're gonna go through in just a couple of seconds. But in the bio is written, the bio is written in third person. The purpose of the bio is to briefly describe your artistic version, vision, what studies and travels that have influenced your work, recent exhibitions, performance or publication history, and major artistic milestones, and what possibly what reviewers have said about your work. A bio is generally two paragraphs long, so imagine getting all of that into two paragraphs. Every sentence counts. One or two sentences describing the goal of your work, taken from paragraph one of your artist statement, one paragraph on recent major exhibitions and or publications, and a closing paragraph about education and personal life. 
I always suggest that if you need to see a, a sample of a bio that you just type in, go to your favorite, get, go to your favorite search engine, type in an artist that you really enjoy with, with plus bio and see a few examples so that you can see how to write your bio. The next is the artist statement, which is uh, difficult for artists to write in some cases. Can we scroll up, please? The artist statement begins with a brief description that conveys your artistic vision and philosophy. And then there's a series of paragraphs that follow. One or two sentences on the focus of your work, a paragraph on the reason meaning of your work, viewer response, a paragraph on artists who have influenced with specific works and explaining why, a paragraph on the description of your artistic process, a paragraph describing the most recent portfolio of works, and a paragraph on how collaborative artists or employees are involved in the production of your artwork, musical performance pieces, or published works. You can imagine that if you have a paragraph for each one of these items, this statement could be one to two pages long. If you're a performance artist, describe the style, instruments, and orchestration you use in your most recent pieces. And for writers, describe your literary style, influences, recent, recently completed work, and work in process. Uh, research the statements of your favorite artists. I always suggest to research others by typing in the, in the words name plus artist statement. Then we have the work samples. Work samples are one of the most important elements of your proposal. Excellent, can we scroll up please? Excellent quality work samples are essential. Your work samples can range from JPEGs and TIFFs to manuscripts and videos, depending on your artistic discipline. You will be asked to provide an image list with title, date, medium size, and venue as appropriate for your field. This is absolutely one of the most important elements of any proposal for an artist is the quality of the art and the quality of the image. So make sure that your samples are first rate. Press articles and reviews or something else that might be asked for a proposal package. You'll be asked to upload PDFs or send copies of reviews and articles with publication name and date clearly visible on the page. In many cases, you'll be asked to provide referrals and letters of recommendation for tr from trusted colleagues, teachers, curators, historians, critics, and gallerists. I always suggest that you begin gathering a letters of recommendation before you even begin applying for any grants. Several individuals will only, you know, some teachers, curators, and historians will only write a letter that is uh, targeted to a specific funding source, but others who are trusted friends may allow you to reuse a letter more than once. <clears throat> Finally, the budget. Requests for artist fellowships don't require budgets, but larger commissions, project-oriented mm -hmm. grants, and artist and resident grants, artist and residence grants will require proposed project budget. Remember, you're always welcome to call the funder to ask budget questions. This is something you must remember. They're there to help you complete your proposal. Include your fee as an artist, fees for materials and supplies, equipment rental or purchase, space rental, and promotion and marketing, as well as expenses related to your project, including other collaborative artist fees. Take time to research the fair value of these expenses by getting quotes from several different sources. Your budget should also include income, including funds, uh, from other grants, in-kind donations of services and products, sales donations, and volunteer, and volunteer time. For the emergency grants that we're gonna go through tonight, you may be asked to supply IRS tax forms, family annual in total income, rent or mortgage payments, recent art sales income, and additional income details. A little bit better, no, it's not very much better. <sighs> Sorry about that. Alexa, do we have any questions? Here's something I found on the web. According to sparkpeople.com. <laughs> we don't have any questions through the chat or Facebook just yet. Okay. Um, oh, I do have a question for you, Linda. Mm -hmm. Let's say you're an emerging artist and you don't have an extensive exhibition um, history or you've exhibited maybe once or twice, you're just starting, you just graduated from, from, um, from art school. Mm -hmm. um, does this, does, do I have an opportunity to still apply? What are my chances? 
Um, could you put my picture back up for me? Your picture? There I am. That's better yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. In this case, it's very specific. If, you're, if you've just gotten out of school, then everything you will apply for will be an emerging artist opportunity. Mm -hmm. When you read the application guidelines, you want to make sure that they don't demand a seven-year history mm -hmm. of publication or exhibition. Mm -hmm. Emerging artist grants are meant specifically for artists who have just started out. And uh, in that case, everything will change for you as an emerging artist. They won't expect you to have more than you know, like a one-page resume. But what I always tell people is that you should never underestimate what you've already accomplished. Mm -hmm. you, should, you should be very careful to always include everything that you've done in school as a part of any kind of activity that you did while you were in school, involvement with any nonprofit organizations or community-based nonprofits or arts organizations, and to apply specifically for those opportunities that are meant for emerging artists. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. We have one question through the chat. Someone asked, a lot of applications ask for a CV, but then also have a page limit. How does one respond to that? In that case, what I always suggest is that you, if you have a one page limit, that you take the, the, top, the top opportunities, exhibitions, publications, and special projects that you've been involved with in the last, say, three years. If they give you two pages, that's what I do the same thing. As I go through my CV, I look at the last three to five years, whatever I can fit on those two pages, and basically take the top opportunities, the solo shows, of course, any museum affiliations, of course, any uh, uh, what group shows at major institutions and publications and, you know, uh, what uh, special projects involved with the major arts institutions. So you basically call it, you call the list, to make to focus on the most important opportunities. Does that make sense? Another question that we've received is what advice can you give artists who are making up their mm -hmm. budget and how do they come up with one? Um, well, I suggest that you sit down and make a list of everything that you need to be able to make it the project happen. Uh, every item that you would need from uh, general supplies to art supplies to printing to printing opportunities uh, outreach opportunities uh, staffing uh, what uh, consulting you know if you need something built like you know you need a fabricator whatever you need make a list and then after that begin researching what each one of those objects cost if you need 500 flyers in double-sided on pink paper, then call up FedEx Kinko's and find out what it takes. If you need to create a campaign on your website or on Facebook and you need help with that and you need a consultant for that, call someone, find out how much that, how much that costs and be realistic about your budget. Don't make up numbers, research your numbers because the funding source and their panel would not, will know what things cost. Any other questions, Alexa? No more questions. Okay. So we'll move on to the Artist Fellowship. Give it a try. Lighting's okay. better now, right? <laughs> had to work yeah. that out. <laughs> I had to work that out. Here we go. Well, this is an interesting one, the Artist Fellowship. And the links will be also included on self help Graphics site so that you can go back to these applications to see um, you know, what they're offering and how you will apply. This is actually a shorter one. And so we're going to look at it and I'm going to read as best as I can as we go through it, highlighting some of the more important elements. The Artist Fellowship resources have been overwhelmed, of course. Effective immediately, we're temporarily limiting uh, relief and assistance applications. Those qualified applicants who are dealing with immediate medical emergencies and their aftermaths. So this is a medical emergency COVID opportunity, emergency opportunity. Uh, thank you for understanding and support. This is an online application only, but you will find the high majority of applications are all online. That's why things must be turned into PDFs. If you're planning to submit an application via USPS, please check here for our application PDF and download the application. So they are allowing you to print it out if you absolutely have to. Please take a moment to read this before filling your application. As we go through this, you're going to find that all of the items that, I've, or, that I went over during our first moment together will be covered in both of these applications that we're going to be reviewing today. 
Here's a checklist. The following material must accompany this application. We suggest you gather this information in one place on your desktop for easy uploading. Number one, a signed copy of your household's most recent IRS tax and Schedule C, if you have a Schedule C. A Schedule C means it's a business. It's, a for, it's, it's your business as an artist. I complete a Schedule C and have for many years. Perhaps you do, perhaps you don't. But it allows you to be able to write off uh, mileage and uh, art supplies, et cetera, in your tax uh, when, you, when you submit to the IRS. Number two, a letter detailing the reasons for financial assistance. And notice that that is one page in length. They want you to go in detail quite obviously. One page is 250 words to talk about why you need these funds. A copy of official documents supporting the amount requested, like it's doctors and medical records, dental expenses, funeral expenses, rent and utility bills if you're in the arrears, repair bills to your home or studio resulting from a disaster. So they're not only asking you to describe what it is that you need in 250 words, but they're also asking you to back up what you're saying with documents from your doctor, uh, uh, what is it, invoices uh, and bills, I would think. There's a utility bill, maybe even a, re a rent bill if you have one. They want you to please include catalogs from exhibitions, magazine articles, or documentation that validate your professional status. Um, this is the reason why you begin collecting these objects as soon as possible. Then they have you go through a series of, uh, of, of uh, boxes. You need to fill in a bunch of boxes with your date of birth, your name, your address, your phone number, what kind of art you make, or let's see, check the type of art you practice and for which you receive compensation, the number of years that you've received income from your artwork. And we're going to see in the uh, Paulette Krasner that they ask you to also tell them how much money you make from your art every year. They ask you for schools attended. If you're a member of any arts organizations, they ask you to list that. They ask for family uh, information, which includes what your marital status. And they ask you to tell them why or if your children or parents can offer assistance, and if not, why. This is a, a, I would assume that this box only allows you to put in so many characters. They don't actually mention the number of characters, but I'm sure is once you begin typing in this box that you'll find you can only put in so many words. They ask you how you heard about the fellowship. They ask you for your health insurance information, a medical plan and its limits. They ask you if you're enrolled in Medicare, Medicaid, other or none. They ask you non-liquid assets, real estate. Do you own a house? Basically is what they're asking you, do you own a studio? They ask you what your monthly mortgage maintenance and or rental payment is. They ask you if you own your home, they ask you to check a box, own a studio, rent a studio, or your studio is located in your home. And then they ask you to list other organizations that you've applied to for financial assistance. And if you've received any grants within the past 12 months, they ask you for the source. Then finally, they ask you if you've ever received assistance from the Artist Fellowship. In most cases, they will not allow you to apply once again. They like to be able to spread their resources around. And then they ask for your signature. And then they ask you to please upload the following. The tax, the tax returns and a schedule C. They, actually, they ask you to upload this, which is pretty, this is, we're gonna find this also in the Paulette Krasner. They wanna see the, the proof of your financial situation and the one page letter uh, um, for reasons financial assistance. The one page they ask you to upload that as a PDF as well, I would assume. They ask you to upload your CV, which should include exhibition history, awards, fellowship, permanence collections, et cetera. I would suggest you use a list that, I, that I've created for you. They ask you if you have a current website. And then they ask you to upload 10 images if you do not have a website, which is interesting. So they're gonna visit your website and look, for, and look at your art on your website, which would save a lot of time but in many cases, as we'll see in the Paulette Krasner, they also ask you, they will ask you to upload JPEGs, no larger than two, um, uh, two megabytes each, which is pretty much standard. And then they ask you to upload those files.
It's interesting that they don't ask you details about that. Let's scroll down and say no. It's interesting, in most cases, they will ask you to upload another document which tells them all the details about the, uh, the, the actual pieces. And that's that. They're located in New York. You can go to info at, you can write, you can email them at info at artistfellowship.org, I assume, to ask questions. Pretty easy, actually. One question we received is, when you're doing written portions of an application, should things always be double spaced and is there an expected point size? Um, uh, funding sources don't like it when you use anything below 10. I usually use 11 or 12, depending on how much I have to say and how much room I've given. Uh, when they say one page, make sure that it's one page. I would suggest that you stay, uh, I mean, I, you can use, uh, they don't give, some funding sources give you very specific indications about margins, about spacing, about all a number of paragraphs, et cetera. They haven't really said much of anything. So I would assume that it would be all right for you to use five, you know, um, margins of five points, you know, uh, on all four sides. But uh, I wouldn't try to cram too much into it so that it becomes difficult to read and you know, just difficult to see and to read, but I'd rather make it a friendly document. When you look at it, it's easy to read and um, simple for the panel because they're gonna be reading a great deal of these uh, applications. Um, I wanted to say that last week, Yvonne mentioned uh, or encouraged the artists not to um, exclude the additional work that they do, uh, for example, um, teaching artist um, in as their CV and it, it adds a lot to the value of their work um, as artists as well yes. so, That's why um, it, it, yeah it's Pardon. very important to think of all the ways that your your work um, as an artist as a teacher mm -hmm. or in, in any other fields of uh, how you um, how your work as an artist uh, contributes to different segments. Um, mm -hmm. You're a photographer and you, you get hired to do these other events, uh, commercial events, that's how you also um, are um, contribute. Um, so to put that under your experience. Yes, the professional experiences allow you to share all of the different ways that you're involved in the art world, how mm -hmm. you participate as an artist in, your, in the broader community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One other question you received is, do you have any specific recommendations on writing an artist statement? I suggest that you follow the outline that I've given to you. A lot of artists have a lot of difficulty writing artist statements. And so I've really delineated the artist statement to give you a list of paragraphs that could be written. I suggest you start uh, by following that outline and uh, write down the paragraphs. If you have to write more than one paragraph, that's fine, but I suggest that you edit it um, a great deal. Edit it maybe four times, maybe even up to six, because you'll find that as you go through it, that some things have been forgotten, some things have been overstated, and every sentence should count. Every sentence should, uh, should be impactful and, and share part of the artist's work and share part of what you're, what you're accomplishing. Um, I also suggest that you read other artist statements online so that you can see how other people talk about their work. Some artists talk about it from an intellectual point of view, from study and uh, historical value. Some write it from a cultural point of view. Some write it from, um, I tell stories of mine. I started out like this, and then I did that, and then I did this, and then I did that, and that's how I ended up here. Everyone writes differently. Everyone talks about their work differently. Follow the way that you write about your work but I suggest that you follow my outline to be able to guide you through a series of topics that the funder wants to hear from, wants to hear about your work. Yeah. I hope and that's helpful. Yeah, I think also, um, I think there's in the, in the art world, there's a tendency to use, what, what's the uh, word, superfluous vocabulary, as they say. Um, and so not overcomplicated, uh, and be the it's about being clear and making mm -hmm. sure that your your statement um, really reflects what you do, mm -hmm. and and not fill it in with these um, empty words um, just mm -hmm. to sound 
uh, I don't know, to sound in a specific way. Um, I've, I was told to make sure that it's a it's an interesting story. Mm -hmm. That's what I've been told about the statements that I've written for some of the uh, proposals that I've written about my, for my work is that uh, people will say, oh, that was, it was really interesting to read, Linda. I really enjoyed reading that. So you want to make sure that you write something that's enjoyable to read. And like you say, it's informative about what you do. Um, it doesn't get so abstract that by the time you're finished reading it, you still don't know what the artist does. Yeah. You know what the artist does, how they work, and what they produce and what their focus and mission is as an artist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that it intrigues you to want to go look at the work. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Or, or that in, that you can actually, from reading the statement, you can actually imagine the work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You actually have a, an idea of what the work is about and what it means. And then when you go to the visuals, you it, they match. Yes. Like when you look at the work and you read the statement, they actually go along as a pair. Mm -hmm. You don't want to get one kind of work and talk about your work in a different way so that they just sort of cross, but that they actually fit as you know, descriptive in a way that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Is there another question? We have another question. It's, do you have any advice for designers and digital artists with a practice that's not exhibition or studio based? Well, it's web based, right? It's internet based. I wouldn't think there'd be much difference at all. It's the same thing you're producing. You have, a, you have, a, you have an object that you produce. Uh, possibly it's more ethereal because it sort of passes through the, you know, through the web, but it still has a series of, uh, of, of opportunities where it's seen, uh, where it's uh, re-seen, where it's written about, where it's shared. I think that uh, it would be pretty, it'd be fun to write a resume like that, talking about a, a totally new digital kind of form of art, but it can be done. I don't see any difficulty with it. Publications, I mean, if that's what they're referring to, any publications that their work has been featured in, that's... Well, means of all kinds, online publications is everywhere, uh, whether maybe it was seen on a certain channel or possibly there's a series of YouTube, uh, YouTube listings. Um, I, I, don't, I don't see that that's a difficulty at all. As a matter of fact, that's pretty much uh, a lot of what people are looking at, what a lot of people are interested in. And writing a resume like that, I think, could be very interesting and very edifying. Yeah, the, the content on the web um, is equally as relevant or carries as, as much weight. Um, I think Absolutely. With, yeah, I mean, given that like, our society today, definitely. Yes, I, absolutely. I don't, I don't see any problem with that at all. A lot of my special projects are online projects. Uh, a lot of them, like, you know, even today. I mean, this is a special project that is, has nothing to do with an exhibition, has nothing to do with uh, publishing hard, in hard copy. It's a living live object. Okay. Hope that was helpful. Any other questions on the Artist Fellowship before we move on to the big? There is another question. Uh -huh. um, let's see. How strong does publication influence the way that you should structure your application? Publication of what? How strong does, you mean if you've been published? I think that is what they're referring to. Yes. It can carry weight. Um, and the way that I generally suggest that my students consider publication, because a lot of artists have difficulty having their work published, written about, whether it's written about and published online or written about and published in books, is to uh, begin reaching out to uh, scholars who are interested in writing about art especially your type of artwork, which is the most important uh, aspect of this kind of request, and to ask someone to write about what you do and publish it. And you can begin publishing in self-published uh, uh, catalogs. There's all different types of ways to do that online now. And that's the way that I began. I began asking, uh, yes, blogs do count as publications. Um, Especially, but only if you can't, the interesting thing about it is that you can't write about yourself. I mean, you have an artist statement, which are all, is generally always included in a publication. But what you need in this context is to have someone else writing about you. And if you can get someone who has a scholarship in art 
who is interested in writing articles and would like to be published because writers also, you know, scholars need to be published. So they're on one end and you're on the other. So if you reach out to scholars, historians, curators, um, even um, members of the, uh, what the nonprofit community-based art world to write something about your work and either self-publish or publish in collaboration with an exhibition, which is even better to publish in collaboration with an exhibition. And in my history, I've published my own catalogs in collaboration with my own exhibitions in the past to be able to help sort of, um, you know, get this process started where more and more people will write about your work. I hope that was helpful. Okay. So we'll move on. So now we're going into the Pollock Krasner and good luck to us. I don't know if I can read this much. We'll see what we can get done. It says, be sure to read through the entire application, including the attachment page prior to beginning. They have a lot of rules and regulations. They're pleased to evaluate your request on the basis of the following data supporting material attached to the end of this application. Please consult their guidelines on their website. Be aware that the U.S. Department of Treasury does not have a sanctioned country list, which if you're an artist, you have to be a U.S. citizen. Uh, sanctioned list can be found on the U.S. Department of Treasury website. You have to be a U.S. citizen to apply for this. The, community, the Committee of Selection meets periodically. It is the foundation's practice to verify all information. Uh, further financial data, such as copies of personal or corporate tax returns, insurance records, or letters from physicians may be required and will be requested if necessary. So the first thing they're going to do is look at your art, look at your statement, look at your CV, and see if they consider you um, worthy of consideration, and then they'll ask you for additional information. Information supporting documents applied in this application will be held in strict confidence by Paulette Krasner. Please note, the application review process takes up to nine months to complete. All materials submitted with this application become the property of the Pollock Krasner Foundation. The decisions made by the foundation are final and are not subject to review or appeal, which is in most cases, this is how it functions. You can't, you can't, you can't appeal a, a funding source a decision on a grant applied for. Should you receive a grant, you give, the, Pollock found, uh, you give the, the, the foundation permission to release your name, grant amount and images of your work for use in all digital communication, paid advertising, website and online digital images. They, they, they want to be able to tell others that they've uh, a grant, given you a grant. And this is actually good for you as well, because then the whole world will see you and other opportunities will come from it. The foundation is required in, and to make inquiry from time to time to the artist as to the use of funds granted, which means they might ask you for a report on how money how monies are spent. The foundation reserves the right to discontinue payments if they find out that you're, you're not spending it on what you said you were going to spend, spend it on. And uh, this happens even in nonprofit organizations too. Submitting this application indicates that you reviewed, understood, and agreed to all the terms outlined above. They want to make sure that you know what you are, what the agreement is. All information will be held in strict confidence. It must be completed in English. Special keyboard uh, characters such as accent marks cannot be used. It's usually just plain text. In every case, in situations like this, when they ask you to upload something like statements, I suggest that you write them in Word save them in Word, and then, and then copy and paste them. So if something happens, there's some kind of glitch online, you can always, you didn't, you didn't actually write it in the, in the application, but you wrote it in Word, that way you, you're safe. And Linda, I just wanna interrupt you for very quickly. So um, as, as uh, Linda mentioned, they will call, the Paul Krasner does check in with artists because this is, I can't remember if it's a six month grant or a year long grant where they provide you with a, a monthly stipend. Um, so for, for that reason, um, they, they check up on, on, on the artist to see how the money is spent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can we scroll up? Oh, not too fast. So now they ask you for a prefix, name, Middle name. It's off screen now. I can't see the dot. There it is. Uh, please list how you're known professionally, the country of citizenship, mailing address, primary phone. Keep going. Email, website, resident city. U.S. territory, date of birth, relationship status, spouse, children, 
They ask if you've applied before, if you've ever received a grant from the foundation, and they ask how you've heard about the foundation. They ask your highest uh, degree awarded, your awarded name of the institution, any other degrees. They ask you for professional experience, which is pending applications, fellowships, scholarships, or financial assistance, from whom and when. They ask for professional, the, at, at, the, at the end of this, they're gonna, you're gonna see, we're gonna finally come to a page which is gonna allow you to upload these documents. They're kind of going through them in a list now, and then you'll be saving them as a PDF and uploading them as a whole. So then they ask you, in, for your professional background, oh, can you go down, go down a bit, please? Down, 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 down. A little bit more. Sorry. Keep going. Oh my goodness, you're really, really down now. I go to the top of the document. Keep going. Okay, there we go. Number of dependent children. I'm at the bottom now. If you've received an award, an educational experience, other degrees, professional experience, and this is where we were, professional awards including residencies, fellowships, prizes, enter each award starting with the most current. This is obviously something uh, for an artist who has uh, quite a lot of history that you can tell that right away because they're already asking for awards and residencies and fellowships and prizes. In the following fields, please enter your exhibition history. Do not include student shows, juried exhibitions, benefits or auctions. They want your solo shows, the, the 10 most recent solo exhibitions, starting with the most current, including location. These exhibitions must be included in your attached resume. Do not include exhibitions that have not occur in, uh, occurred yet. Location and year for each of the 10 shows. They give you a sample. Then they have group shows. They want solos first, then groups. The 10 most recent group exhibitions. Location. They have to be included in the resume and then they give you a sample. And then they ask you to include a, um, please enter the medium of the work shown in the 10 images that you'll be submitting. And uh, the range should include only the dimensions of the smallest work in the group that you are submitting and the dimensions the largest in the group you are submitting. Be sure that the information corresponds. Um, do not include your entire image list. Follow this format. So this looks like it is a, this is, this is some place in the actual application where we'll be able to, uh, to answer these questions, but they're giving you directions now. For the 10 images that you're submitting, you're gonna have to tell them what they're looking at. Then they ask you for references. They ask you to furnish the names, complete mailing addresses and email addresses of three individuals the foundation may contact for expert evaluation of your work in professional standing. So they have re reference number one, name, title, mailing address, email relationship to the applicant. They have your artist colleague, mentor, art critic, gallerist, curator, or collector. And they have reference number two, same information. And then reference number three, same information. Now they have financial disclosure. The following information is required to assist in evaluating the need of the applicant. This information will be held in complete confidence, further financial data, as I said before, such as copies of personal and or tax returns, insurance records, letters from physicians may be required, just like the other application as well. All amounts must be shown in US dollars. Provide your gross annual income, earned solely from art sales below. Then they ask for the last three years, 2017, 2018, and 2019. What is your current combined gross annual household income from all sources? Just like the first document that we went through where I outlined this, these are the, these are the types of information they ask for in emergency grants. This amount is the total yearly income of your entire household prior to any expenses or deductions. It includes income from your spouse or legal partner, whether filing jointly or separate, separately. Are you receiving income from Social Security or a pension? If applicable, what is the current amount per year that you receive from Social Security and or a pension? What are your current annual professional expenses excluding rent?
So here we go. You can see here, this is what, what you see actually on the website. And you can see you have a welcome on the left, personal information, followed by education experience, professional experiences, references, financial disclosure, and attachments. So each one of those, I would assume, you would click on them and be able to fill out a series of forms. So here we have, please attach the following materials. Be sure to read the following instructions carefully. Attachments do not follow these and the application will be considered incomplete. Attachments one through four must be sent as Microsoft doc, uh, Word documents. Digital images must be files in, files in a Docsx, PDF, or JPEG extension. Oh, interesting. I, I assume that they want you to uh, copy and paste uh, images into a docs. Please use a legible font size type and size for all documents. Uh, unfortunately, the document's cut off on the right, so I can't read it totally. They ask for a cover letter. Starting with what specific, specific purpose, professional, personal, or medical, you require funds and in what amount funds you seek will be used to advance your artistic career and well-being as a creative artist. This letter and other materials must be complete com the, by the length required for the cover letter. Make sure that you are sending a final draft of your the final draft of your cover letter. Your name must be included. And this is the format that they give it to you, last name cover letter dot doc. Then they ask you to upload a resume and they gave you the whole list of how the resume should look. We just went through it. And then they tell you how it should be saved. Then they have an artist statement, a one page statement describing the 10 images you'll be included in your application. And they tell you how that should be saved as well. So you're going to be uploading 10 images and then describing the 10 images that you have uploaded for them to look at, which, uh, which means that I would suggest in this case that the images be cohesive, they be a cohesive body of work. So when you talk about it, you're talking about one specific idea or one specific suite that you can speak about as an entirety and then show the 10 images. Then you have the, here we are, the image identification list, which is a listing of all the 10 pieces with all the information that's needed. For example, John Smith, image number one, 2010, and then the, uh, the type of work and the size and the media. So this is a list that actually gives them all the details regarding the 10 pieces you're uploading, and that will be saved as last name image list dot doc. And then digital images one through 10. Let's see if they explain this a little bit more clearly now. Only accept images work completed within the last 10 years. Do not include maquettes or other unfinished work with your submission. Work done with others cannot be included unless applying as a collaboration. They do not accept individual images. You may, however, use two of the 10 images to show detail. Each image must be formatted as a JPEG and that's because I can't read that and must include the longest dimension, 300, 300 DPI. So they, they do want you to attach images. What they were talking about looks like the image identification list as a dot doc. So then they have example, Smith underscore John underscore one JPEG, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then they have upload instructions. Select the type of file you're going to attach from the title bar. For example, if you're attaching, need to scroll down to digital image. Click on the button mark browse, search your computer and upload the image. And then down here, they actually give you a chance to put in what it is that you're uploading as they have required you to do so. You can save it and finish later or review and submit. Uh, although we're looking at this document now, um, in, in not in a live sense where we're actually being able to click around and actually you know, open things up, I'm sure that once you go to the online application, it'll become much more, um, much easier to understand because you'll be able to see all of this uploading, the, all the buttons on the bottom will be easy to uh, understand just by clicking on them in a live, in, in live time. But they do ask for quite a lot more information than the first one that we reviewed and several of the emergency funds that are coming up are asking for financial documentation and or bits and pieces of this more and or less. I hope that was helpful.
we've received one question and it is in picking who to ask for references who do you suggest to ask curators mentors or a mix a mix i was told recently that uh, uh asking an artist friend who had gotten the award before was a good idea i hadn't heard that one before i suggest that you uh consider asking individuals that you've worked with most recently don't ask don't ask someone who you worked with 10 years ago uh, ask someone that you worked with just very recently who knows possibly who knows about the body of work that you're submitting that might be another way to go as well to make sure that the people that you ask are really informed about your work that know your most recent efforts and they've seen you as an artist um, you know uh, in the community working and know your character and know um, your capacity Linda, I, I can I figure this one is um, definitely for artists who are much more established or have a, a, a longer history, of, uh, a longer history exhibiting, absolutely and producing. But like going back to like emerging art grants for emerging artists um, who ask for the grants that ask for um, sales history, how how much weight does that carry? That question, Carrie. Well, because you're asking for money to help with your studio and it's an emergency, they, they just want to get an idea of how, how you're making your money and where your money is coming from and how much you're making. So they're, they're not only making a decision based on the quality of the work and the quality of the time that you spend in the art world and in your arts community, but they're also trying to figure out what your real need is. Because that's how they're balancing it out when they see when the panel gets together. They'll go, well, this artist really needs the help. I mean, look at this. So um, I don't, I, th I think that, you know, in this case, if you're asking for emergency funds from Paul at Krasner, it's because you need it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not going to be writing to them and telling them that you make $100,000 in sales every year because they're not going to give you the money. They're going to give it to someone who's really working hard, who maybe isn't making that much money right now and mm -hmm. is really showing a need. And their decision will be based on the quality of the work that the artist is producing and the quality of their relationship with their community regionally as well as nationally and possibly internationally as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, just uh, going back to what uh, Yvonne also had mentioned last week is that these new emerging emergency funds are um, much easier to complete, like that artist fellowship you just reviewed. Um, so the, the the grants that are very specific to the COVID nineteen are much um, are less difficult to complete. Are much more um, flexible. Uh, I mean, I'll follow the rules and follow the instructions, but um, it, it's not as complicated to to complete um, because the goal is to get the funds into your into the artist's hands. That's correct. And as you said earlier, the Pollock Krasner has been giving has been given this money for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And so they have a more complex uh, approach and application. And um, you know the COVID emergency grants are meant to a quick turnaround. They want to help people now. Yeah. And so they're making the application process easier, which makes more sense. But either way, you need to make sure that you read the application carefully to make sure that the application is for emerging artists or mid-career artists or for photographers or for painters or for performance artists. You want to make sure that your, uh, the work that you do is a good match for the, app, for the funding source that you're, that you're applying to. And that takes reading like we've done today and reviewing. We saw very quickly that uh, you also noted that Paulette Krasner wants more information. They want a more substantial career. This might not be the right uh, fit. This might not be a good match for some artists, while it might be a good match for others. Mm -hmm. Any questions, Alexa? Another question we received is, in terms of images, as an installation artist, I sometimes have a hard time boiling down something to a single image. Do you think it is better to present the large view or an interesting detail? Well, uh, what I've seen is uh, 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 an installation, I should say installation or performance, excuse me. Installation. I would suggest that you uh, do multiple images of the same installation in that case. They said there that you could you could include, in some cases you can, they, they count as one of your images and they're basically they're just a detail. But I suggest that you do, uh, you know, uh, 
an overall shot and then some close-ups to be able to show the details of the work. Don't, don't try to boil down, try to tell the complete story of, the, of that particular installation or series of installations. You want them to have a really good sense of what it looks like and what it's talking about, what the installation means, uh, the double entendres, the historical points, all, all of the you know, socio-political points that you're trying to make. Uh, make sure that your images tell the complete story. Any other questions, Alexa? No other questions right now. Can we get the, uh, the document off the screen? Mm -hmm. That's better. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Um, so I just want to um, let people know that th these documents or the video is going to be available uh, on our website as well as uh, our Facebook and YouTube. Um, and then also, oh, I'm sorry, I'm opening up too many pages here. Um, And uh, so I, I want to thank you, Linda. If anybody okay. else has any questions. I hope that my presentation has been helpful for everyone today and um, that I've been able to go through a few of the more important items of applying. And uh, I know that Self-Help Graphics will also be asking you, if you will, to fill out an evaluation form to let us know how we did today. And I want to wish you all the best of luck in applying. There's quite a lot of opportunities out there right now. And I suggest that you, you know, go for it. Now is a good time to go for it. And I sincerely hope that everyone will be, you know, well and safe. Yes. Thank you again. Uh, so thank you, everyone, for joining the Art Lab program tonight. And again, thank you, Linda, so much for your time. Thank your you wisdom and your ex and sharing your experience with everyone. Uh, please remember that you can find the links on Self Pop Graphics website, link tree, our link tree, and on Linda's page, uh, A to Z Grant Writing with Linda Vallejo. Thank you, Alexa. Uh, Thank you, Marbella. Thank you, Self Pop Graphics. Um, in addition, we're going to, like uh, Linda said, we're going to send out the evaluation on behalf of, uh, of Linda uh, to everyone who jo joined us via Zoom and you can receive more grant writing info from her when, um, when you uh, fill out that information. And then, so um, I did wanna uh, wrap this up by, by stating that uh, we are aware that there is an influx of online content prior to this pandemic, and it's even, and the websites or the online content is even more saturated now. Mm -hmm. And so I hope we did provide something fruitful to, to your day. And so next week, we invite you to come back on April 15th for the Artist Lab. We'll be welcoming Monique Castro from Indigenous Circle of Wellness to facilitate a virtual wellness circle. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to invite participants to share and receive support during these unprecedented times. And it'll be a time of sharing, resonate, listening, and virtual community space. That program will not be made public. It'll be private and we won't be posting it. Mm -hmm. um, so, once so once again, again. so once again, uh, thank you for joining us. Be safe, be strong, and good night. Good night, everybody. Thank you, Alexa. Thanks, Alexa. Hi. <laughs>